Hello, my name is Clark Larson, and I'd like to welcome you to this conference session called Bicycle Level of Traffic Stress, or LTS, as a planning tool with Jennifer Hopkins of Foursquare ITP. This session was pre-recorded before the start of the live virtual conference and is made available for all to view on demand during or after the conference uh, chapter conference, which runs from November 15th to 17th, 2021. AICP planners may claim 0.25 CM credits for viewing this session and for those and everyone else, I hope you enjoy it. So now I'll hand it over to Jennifer to start the session. Thank to you, you, Clark, for that introduction. Um, are you able to see my screen? Yes, just go to full screen slide mode and yeah, ready to go. Great, thank you, Clark. Um, and hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to my presentation. My name is Jennifer Hopkins. I am a transportation planner with Foursquare ITP uh, with a focus in GIS analysis and bicycle pedestrian infrastructure. Um, and today I'm gonna to be talking about the bicycle level of traffic stress analysis um, that I was a part of for um, the MOVE DC long range transportation plan. Um, so I'm gonna be talking a bit about the methodology and results, um, and then I'm gonna be focusing on um, use cases for LTS, um, its application to equity, and then touching on um, conducting your own LTS analysis. So to begin, um, for those that are not familiar, um, MOVE DC is DDOT's long range transportation plan. And this past year, uh, we did a um, update to the plan, which we called the snapshot, where we were looking at um, the baseline and existing conditions um, for the city um, to provide for the update to the long range plan. Um, now this plan includes components for um, bicycle and pedestrian safety and infrastructure, uh, which covered a bicycle level of traffic stress analysis, as well as a pedestrian friendliness index. Um, and today I'm gonna be um, talking about, of course, the bicycle level of traffic stress portion of this. Um, so to begin, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, where the data came from and how we developed it um, and kind of our methodology there. Um, so our data sources all came from um, DDOT's GIS department. Um, the basis of our analysis was based on um, DDOT's centerline linear referencing system or their LRS. Uh, historical crash data for the city, off-road bike, bike trail facilities, as well as signalized intersection data. The DDOT Centerline LTS is made up of three components, each of which were scored separately for this LTS analysis, which I'll go into detail in the preceding slides. Uh, but the first piece of DDOT's Centerline linear referencing system are roadway segments. And these are these black lines that you see on the screen. Um, and the scoring is done for each individual line um, from intersection to intersection across the entire city. The next component of the LRS are intersection approaches. And those are the um, final portion of a roadway segment as it leads up to an intersection. And then the last piece of DDOT's LRS are uh, the intersection points. So again, I went through and scored each of these uh, components separately. Um, they were combined together to come up with the stress level for all of the roadways. Now, first I'm gonna to touch on um, the scoring uh, for segments. Um, the segment scoring uh, depended on um, a few different categories. Um, first we looked at, we categorized the roadways into where bicycles are not permitted. Um, so highways, freeways, <clears throat> um, roadways like that, were excluded um, since bicycles are not allowed to travel along them. Um, and then off-road bicycle facilities were um, given an automatic score of, of LTS one. And then um, kind of the meat of our analysis was looking at and scoring roadways where bicycles are permitted, which is the majority of roadways in the city. So within there, um, the types of roadways were classified differently depending on different characteristics within them. So we looked at um, protected and buffered bike lanes differently from how we looked at conventional bike lanes with parking, conventional bike lanes without parking, and then roadways with no infrastructure at all. Um, each of these roadway characteristics use unique scoring metrics because metrics have different impacts depending on the facilities that they're combined with. 
So um, having parking alongside uh, might have a greater impact um, if you're also looking at a roadway that has a bike lane versus a road with parking and no bike lane. Um, so this is why we're looking at the components separately. Um, now for um, roadways with protected or buffered bike lanes on them, um, for the scoring, we were basing it off of um, posted speed limits as well as driveway and alley crossings. Uh, roadways with conventional bike lanes, so that's your traditional painted bike lane um, that have uh, parking alongside them. Um, their scoring was based on the number of through lanes on that uh, roadway segment, the bike lane width, the parking lane width, the bike lane blockage rate, uh, crashes, and whether or not a roundabout is present within the roadway segment. For conventional bike lanes without parking, again, we looked at uh, the number of through lanes, uh, but for this um, grouping, we also considered the presence of raised medians or the lack thereof. We looked at bike lane width, bike lane blockage rates, crashes, and roundabouts, or the presence of roundabouts. So you can see the difference between the conventional like bike lane with parking and without parking. Um, the differences in the metrics there depended on we're looking at parking lane width for those with, with uh, a conventional bike lane and parking and those that don't have parking. Of course, we can't look at the parking lane width. Um, so we're, in this part, we're interested in the presence of that raised median. For roadways without bicycle infrastructure, um, so that could be um, anywhere from a local neighborhood roadway to uh, a large road, uh, a roadway like um, Connecticut Avenue that has no bicycle infrastructure on it. Um, for those roadways, we're looking at the number of through lanes because, of course, there's a, a significant difference in the number of through lanes on Connecticut Ave versus a, a local road. Uh, we're again looking at the posted speed limit. Um, for this category, we are looking at the presence of a painted center line or lack thereof. And of course, um, as all the others, we're looking at crashes and the presence of a roundabout. Um, moving on to the approach scoring. So that's the, the little portion leading up to um, the intersection along a roadway segment. Um, the scoring for the approaches were broken out into two different categories. Um, for the approach scoring analysis, we were particularly focused on um, approaches that have a bike lane and a right turn lane. So the um, key in scoring the approaches is um, giving focus to how bike lane configurations are impacted by right turn lanes, um, because that's where you're going to see the greatest impact with bicycle infrastructure. So um, for, these, for this category of approaches, we were looking at the right turn lane length, bike lane configuration at the right turn lane, so um, is it a protected bike lane that continues on being protected? Um, is it a bike lane that continues straight or shifts right um, at the right turn lane? Or is it um, a bike lane that shifts left or just ends um, when the, the turn lane takes over? Um, so the, the approaches um, with uh, bike infrastructure and right turn lanes were scored using those criteria. Um, and then all other approaches, so approaches without bicycle infrastructure and or without right turn lane um, take on just the corresponding roadway segment score um, because it's presumed that there's not a, a big difference in roadway characteristics between the segment and the approach in that case. Once the approaches are scored, we moved on to score the intersections. Uh, the intersections were scored um, by classifying them into signalized and unsignalized intersections. So for inter for signalized intersections, um, the scoring for those was based off of um, the LTS score of the intersecting streets, uh, the number of intersecting streets, crash rates, and again, the presence of a roundabout or lack thereof. And for unsignalized intersections, um, we had a few more metrics. Um, in this, we were again looking at the LTS score of intersecting streets and the number of intersecting streets. But in this case, we also pull in the number of through lanes of all of the cross streets that go through the intersection, as well as crashes and the presence of a roundabout. And those metrics give us the final scoring of one to four um, for our stress level. So after we finish the um, scoring of the segments, the approaches, and the intersections, 
the last piece of the LTS is going back and rescoring those initial segments based off of the results of the approach scoring. And the reason we're doing this is because intersection approach scores, we need to aggregate them with those um, segment scores. And we're gonna do that using the weakest link logic. So um, in this weakest link logic idea, um, it's, it's the idea that those approach characteristics, um, those metrics related to bikes um, in the approaches can make a segment's LTS worse, but not better. So if a segment, if a roadway segment has bike infrastructure and um, in the intersection approach, a right turn lane appears and that bike infrastructure ends and the cyclist has to then ride in mixed traffic, that um, portion of the roadway that the cyclist must go through then needs to be accounted into the overall roadway segment stress level. Um, so all that to say, if a, if a segment has a LTS of three and its corresponding approaches have an LTS of less than two, the combined stress level is gonna remain a three because the approach scores are lower than the segment score. Whereas if you have, for example, approaches that have an LTS four, um, regardless of what the underlying segment score is, um, this segment will automatically become an LTS four. So if you look up at the top of the screen, um, you'll see that um, in this scenario, we have a roadway segment of an LTS three. Um, those approaches have an LTS two, which of course is lower stress than LTS three. So the resulting score of that roadway is going to be LTS three. In the next scenario, we have a roadway that's LTS two. Um, its approaches are LTS four and three. Um, depending on the end of the roadway segment that you're at. And so if you can imagine um, a cyclist is traveling along this roadway, it wouldn't be accurate to say that it is an LTS2 because in order to get anywhere from that roadway segment to leave the roadway segment, the cyclist would have to travel through um, LTS3 or an LTS4. So to account for that change in characteristics, the roadway segment takes on the highest score of the approaches, which in this case is an LTS-4. So um, in summary, the methodology, we start with scoring those roadway segments. Um, then we go ahead and score the approaches, uh, score the intersections, and then we take those approach scores in number two, in step number two, and we rescore those roadway segments in step number one. And that gives us um, our final results of um, roadway and intersection scores. Um, the final results, you know, the public, the, the approach scoring is the behind the scenes component of this. And kind of the final results um, is just looking at the segments and the intersections. And now I have, you know, two pretty maps up on the screen and it's like, okay, great. We're done with LTS and we know the, the scoring of the roadways and the stress level. But I mean, what do we do now? What do we, we have these maps with lots of colors on them and you can kind of see a pattern, but it kind of makes sense. We've got the, the larger roads with a higher stress and the, the, the um, more local roads with a lower stress. So what do we do with that? Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about next and what I really wanna focus on here is, is how to make use of this LTS network. Once you've made it, once you've it's a, put in this big effort for data collection, uh, what can we do to utilize it and to, to find some good benefit from putting in all of that work? So I've come up with um, some LTS use cases, um, some examples of, of what we've done on um, other projects as well as this one. Um, one of the first examples is using LTS for an existing conditions assessment. Um, in this case, um, you would be trying to understand um, the impact of land use on stress level and different patterns across the city of stress level and land use. Um, you're also going to be looking at potentially stress level distribution. So where's the highest concentration of those LTS for streets? Um, you're going to be looking for gaps within the network. So what key destinations are inaccessible due to net network gaps? Um, or maybe you're looking at, you know, what combination of the study area street characteristics are creating the lowest stress streets or the highest stress streets. Essentially, you're trying to find a pattern so you can use that for future planning. The next use case that I have here is um, network analysis. So that's when you turn your um, LTS roadway network into a routable network. Um, 
<clears throat> and with this sort of analysis, there's lots you can do. Um, we have scenario modeling um, where you're looking at, you know, what project scenario will have the greatest impact on improving network connectivity and accessibility. So we've got 10 projects that we want to implement and enough funding to implement three of them. Which of those three are going to have the greatest impact on improving connectivity and accessibility? <clears throat> so with that, you've got scenario modeling and <clears throat> a connectivity assessment. Um, <clears throat> you can also uh, identify critical network gaps, uh, measure impacts of proposed improvements. Um, so we're trying to, with this sort of network analysis, answer questions like how many jobs are accessible within a 20 minute bike ride? So from any given neighborhood, any given census block, any given point within the city, how many jobs or how many jobs are accessible within a 20 minute bike ride or within a 30 minute bike ride or a 20 minute bike ride where we're only using LTS one and two or a 30 minute where we're using LTS one, two and three. Um, lots of different scenario combinations that you can look at depending on your need. Um, you can look at things, of course, beyond jobs. You can look at access to grocery stores. You can look at access to schools. Um, and another great thing that you can do with this is um, pull in bike share. So you can model uh, how many, you know, what's, what's the access level for a person in any given census block walking to a bike share station uh, on a roadway that you know, has sidewalks because we have that data incorporated into the network. They walk to the closest bike share station, they take the bike share, and how far can they get on this entire journey of walking to the bike share station and taking the bike and biking on these low stress roadways, how far can they get in 20 minutes, in 30 minutes? And of course, you can do um, sub analyses of all these things, looking at different demographics, socio demographic and economic demographic <clears throat> questions. The next use case that I have on here is using LTS to inform planning and investment decisions. Of course, that's why we're here talking about um, LTS at a planning conference. Um, so LTS is great for um, carrying out uh, jurisdictional planning goals and objectives. Um, it's a great way to incorporate equity and um, allocate resources, which of course, allocating resources in an equitable way is another way to look at it. So in this case, um, you might be answering questions for stakeholders such as, you know, what race, what race, what gender, what household types, your one car households, low income households have the greatest or lowest access to um, key destinations by bicycle. And of course, that question in and of itself can tell us a lot about what's happening in the city. Uh, we can look at how accessible will development X be upon completion. So if we you know, put this development here and we run an analysis and we say the bike access is quite low. Okay, well, how can we improve the network to connect that new development to the existing low stress network? Uh, you can also answer questions, um, as I mentioned, such as, um, you know, what race, what gender, what uh, household type um, is going to see the greatest benefit from a particular investment? So, you know, is this investment equitable? Let's look at how it's improving access for different socio-demographic groups within our study area. Um, the last, the last um, use case that I have on here as an example um, is using LTS for performance monitoring. Um, <clears throat> LTS is um, a, a big data collection effort um, and um, those characteristics change quickly, um, especially if you're incorporating um, components such as um, roadway conditions, um, or you're doing a lot of implementation of new bicycle infrastructure and things are rapidly changing, that means your LTS is inevitably go going to um, <clears throat> be changing as well. And so you can use that to track progress over time. So you can um, identify what changes have been made to the network that have had um, big impacts on connectivity and accessibility. Um, hold your jurisdictions accountable. Uh, are we um, meeting our bicycle connectivity accessibility goals? Um, are we putting down um, as much investment and new infrastructure as um, planned? Um, and then of course we can um, use the performance monitoring to identify patterns over time. So um, are streets tending to um, become higher stress or become lower stress? Are we moving 
you know, towards having a, a complete lower stress network or is the connectivity just not there yet? The, the bicycle infrastructure keeps being added in chunks that are not providing a connected effort, uh, a connected network. Um, so again, here we might be looking at what streets have improved or de decreased their LTS scores in a given time frame. Um, what streets got more stressful and why? Uh, what metrics had the greatest impact on decreasing stress level um, over the years as the roadway conditions have changed? Uh, and then of course, um, how has accessibility improved or changed? Has it improved or changed? Uh, have we made implementations, but in the overall network, if there hasn't been a big impact on accessibility, or you know, have we made you know small uh, gap filling gaps that have had big impacts on accessibility and connectivity? So these are all important questions that you want to leverage your LTS network to be able to answer. Now, moving a bit into the equity side of things, um, we for the Move DC plan, we did take the LTS network. Um, and use it as um, a component of the um, equity framework that is within the MOVE DC plan. Um, so for this, we took our LTS network and we said, um, how many jobs can be accessed from any given census block within the city um, with a 30 minute bike ride? What about a 60 minute bike ride? What if we limit roadways to LTS one or two? And we were able to come up with all these different scenarios to um, overlay those with um, different ind indices that we created, such as the pedestrian friendliness index or concentrations of population types, and trying to find patterns between those accessibility rates and those subcategories that we're looking at along with it. Um, you can take a look at um, which neighborhoods might have the lowest access to public service. Um, where are we seeing food deserts, especially for bike access, or where can we um, try and improve those? through deserts, um, through bicycle infrastructure and, and expanding that low stress network. Um, and then you can take a look at um, where the greatest first and last mile gaps are uh, for bus riders or for transit riders or whatever combination you wanna look at. You can combine this LTS network by pulling in GTFS into your network analysis and modeling a person walking to a bus stop, taking the bus, and uh, biking to their final destination or vice versa, biking to the bus stop, taking the bus and walking, walk, walking or biking to their final destination. So the leverage of the LTS network does not even have to be just bicycling itself. You can also incorporate components like walking and taking transit um, and all the different ways that people might be getting around um, a given area. Um, now, um, in terms of doing your own LTS analysis, um, some of the key takeaways that I've come up with um, in doing this analysis um, is to start small and keep it simple. Um, LTS is, um, in and of itself, a large data collection effort. And in order to have a network where, score, where roadways are scored um, kind of on the same level, you need to have data that's accessible for the entire jurisdiction. You can't have, you know, signalized intersection data for half of your jurisdiction and not half the other because then the, the scoring isn't gonna be the same for the intersections across the city. Um, so you really wanna focus on um, what is available and what is comprehensive and reliable. Um, you could spend years collecting all of this data um, for your LTS, analysis, <clears throat> but um, at the end of the day, you want to consider, you know, how much time are we using collecting this data versus just using the good, reliable data that we already have to get this network out and start using it immediately, um, because you can always build off of your network. There's lots of additional components that you could add in, even to, to, D to DDOT's um, LTS network. Um, we there was talk about adding in um, a temporal component, so looking at street lighting or um, taking out speed limit instead using um, average annual daily traffic rates or um, observed traffic speeds. Um, so you can always build off of an existing network. Um, but another thing that you always want to consider is 
how are you going to keep your data updated and maintained if you're out collecting it? So if you do go out and, and collect you know, information on bike lane widths or parking lane widths, um, those, those things are going to change over time. So how are you gonna maintain those so that your LTS remains up to date? Um, you also wanna narrow down your metrics um, to those that have the greatest impact. Um, different studies that I was um, reading through online when I was developing this methodology um, seem to indicate that you want to limit your metrics to um, less than or equal to seven. Uh, after that, um, the, the impact of additional metrics um, statistically does not have uh, a significant impact on the roadway scoring when you get to such a high number of metrics. Um, so you really wanna focus on those that have the most impact on a cyclist experience because there's unlimited things that you could think of that would impact um, how you feel riding down a street, but you really wanna be narrowed and focused with your analysis in order to, to get the best and most usable results. Um, the next thing is to make it rec replicable. Um, road conditions change quickly. Um, and that inevitably means that you're going to need to update your LTS network. Um, the DDOT LTS network um, was done using R. Um, you can, you know, use it in any scripting language, or it doesn't even have to be a scripting language. You just want to ultimately make sure that it is replicable because you don't want to have to start from scratch every year in remaking your LTS network. Um, and just keeping in mind that it's it's more useful to have a simple and up to date LTS network than it is to have a highly detailed LTS network that's out of date. Um, so that's something that you really wanna keep in mind when you're um, starting on this endeavor and deciding what components you want to use. Um, and the final piece of this is to use the network once you make it. Um, the purpose of calculating LTS and assessing the stress level for, for cyclists is to use it as a tool in planning decisions. Um, it's not just to make a pretty map um, of course, you know, we, we make that map and we look at the different patterns we can see, but then, you know, take a, take a step beyond that and go ahead and look at how to use that network to further your jurisdiction's planning goals or objectives or to really um, complete that bicycle network that um, exists today. Um, so, you know, once once an LTS is done, um, you know, don't you don't want to just leave it on the shelf. You want to actually make use of it um, and and use it as a tool going forward in in lots of different analyses. Um, so with that, um, that is the end of my presentation. Um, if you have any questions or comments, um, you can feel free to contact me. I would be more than happy um, to talk with you. Um, and um, thank you for tuning into my presentation and I hope that you enjoyed it. Great, excellent presentation, Jennifer. I look forward to bicycling on more comfortable streets in DC because of your analysis. Um, and I'll take advantage of the fact that we have no audience because this is pre-recorded, so there's no other questions to compete with mine. But I was wondering, as you were looking at the segments, whether, you, and this would be not keeping it as simple, adding another metric, but whether you considered uh, directional uh, level of comfort or level of stress as far as um, you know, going northbound might have the turn lane, going southbound might have the bicycle lane as opposed to the other side. I imagine that would help with potential routing, but it would make your data set and analysis that much more complicated. Did you consider that or look at that? Yes, so in terms of the routing, uh, we do have the directionality in there. So we have those contra flow bike lanes accounted for, the two-way cycle tracks accounted for. So in terms of routing, that's taken care of. Um, but your point on um, the northbound versus southbound turn lanes, that is not incorporated into this network um, because that is um, just another, as you mentioned, highly complex um, component to put on top of it. But that's not to say it wouldn't be useful. Um, that is something that we certainly considered when looking at the intersection specifically. So depending on which direction, if you're going northbound through an intersection or you're coming across a east westbound, you might have a very different experience. Um, and the data just wasn't quite available 
um, to be able to do it on that detailed level. Um, but it's something that is um, definitely in the minds of how we can build off of this existing LTS in future years. Okay, great. Well, thanks for answering that. Uh, well, thank you everyone else for watching this session and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And please do reach out to Jennifer with any questions. I know there's other jurisdictions around the national capital area, potentially across the country, that are looking at this kind of methodology to uh, consider a level of comfort, level of stress on roadways for both bicycles and pedestrians. Um, I think cars are already thought about. So it's, it's great to be moving into the, the other modes of uh, how people experience roads. So with that, we'll end the uh, session and uh, hope everyone has a great day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.